In Seria lies Brunei Shell Petroleum's Anduki Airfield. Constructed in 1951 with a simple grass airstrip, Anduki has come a long way. This busy service hub has the only Shell-branded aircraft in the global fleet. From here, workers can be ferried to and from the 53 offshore energy facilities. But with new platforms in the South China Seas, operations at Anduki need to expand. And today, project engineer Carl Acornley and his team are taking delivery of shrink-wrapped new additions. It's a process that's been going on and on, and you know, you've always had a deadline, and you know they're coming, but it's actually physically having them here makes a huge difference now. Ordered one year ago, shipped nearly 11,000 miles. Is that it? There's no more trucks? And costing over 26 million US dollars. Two brand new Augusta Westland AW139 helicopters. We've always been a fairly small operation, so this is almost doubled our operation from three aircraft to five aircraft. But before they can fly, there is the big job of unpacking and assembling each aircraft. So it's quite an exciting time for the guys to see brand new helicopters arriving at Anduki. It's not something that happens very often. The new 12-seater AW139s are an addition to Brunei Shell Petroleum's existing fleet of three 19-seater S92s. They are the finishing touch in a large expansion of aviation operations. It's actually a historic milestone in perhaps the history of uh, aviation services in Brunei Shell Petroleum. With this, we are able to drive operational efficiency, uh, improve safety and improve the working condition for the workforce. Bartek Sheshapan is part of the engineering team responsible for these state-of-the-art helicopters. It's the first day with the aircraft in our hangar, so we're essentially just uh, looking over it from the outside in, making sure that uh, everything appears to be uh, arrived in one piece without any damage from shipping. For 18 years, pilot Ishmael Razak has risen through the ranks of BSP and now trains its new pilots. What's uh, special about this particular helicopter is that it's uh, one of the most advanced uh, med medium-sized helicopter in the world. You just don't touch any of uh, the, the, uh, the engines or anything else. It's all automatic. It's just like starting a car. When the battery is in, your fuel valve and uh, you switch it on and start turning. Before Ishmael can begin training new pilots, every single component must be thoroughly checked by the engineers. We'll check the batteries, check the voltages. This aircraft needs two batteries, each twice the voltage of an average car's. Without them, the helicopter is immobilized. At the moment, we have a flat battery, the aircraft internal battery. It may just have discharged in transit because it's been so long, it's been many months to get here. The batteries will take at least two days to fully recharge. In the meantime, the engineers are focusing on the safety features. This, for example, is a rear float. In the event of the aircraft having to make an emergency landing on water, this becomes a big balloon. Inside it has uh, nitrogen bottles, and the cover blows away, and so now you got a, an expensive floating raft. Project engineer Carl is running the checks on these flotation devices. So there was a, a minimum pressure that should be in those bottles. And as you see, there's a graph here on the side which allows us to calculate what that pressure should be. The bottles in this aircraft are below the minimum pressure that is acceptable to fly this aircraft. It was definitely at 4,000 when it left. Now we've just checked it here and the guys just tell me it's at 3,000 again. So there's, there's a leak somewhere. So even if I charge it up, it's still going to drop. In this particular case, we are not allowed to charge the bottles. These state-of-the-art float bottles can only be repressurized at the manufacturers in California. It could mean a two-week wait. That obviously now means that we no longer have floats on this aircraft, which means we cannot fly over water. And as our primary role is offshore maritime, oil and gas, that is a problem. The search is on 
for a spare float bottle. If Carl can't find a fully pressurized replacement, this brand new helicopter will be grounded. Meanwhile, Bartek is checking out the blades. What do we have in these boxes? Our main rotor blades, and I'm about to uh, inspect them, so we'll have to remove them from the box, put them on our little stand, and have a good long look at them, make sure everything is okay. The five main composite rotor blades will slot into a titanium hub and create a 14 meter wide span. It's okay, I got, I got this end, it's okay. As Bartek prepares to fit the blades, Carl has solved the float bottle problem. A replacement has been found in stores. We've got a spare bottle. Take this off, change the bottle out, and then we'll send the spare away and get him to recharge it for whoever he needs to recharge it. This aircraft is back on track. And on the other side of the hangar, the five $150,000 blades are ready to install. Putting main rotor blades on, and it just makes the helicopter look complete. So now it looks like it's at least somewhat fit for flight. Uh, without it, it's like a wingless bird, right? While engineers get the helicopter ready, training captain David Cameron arrives to check progress. Judicious use of the hammer. Yeah. Jolly good. <laughs> the hammer can be a very useful tool. We don't actually call them hammers, we call them persuaders. As soon as a pilot appears on the scene, there's a little bit of a nervousness runs through the crowd, and understandably so. With the helicopter almost complete, Brunei Shell Petroleum's aviation department is about to enter a new phase in its development. I think in the longer term, because of the expansion of activities, uh, there's plenty of opportunity uh, to train up uh, local uh, engineers, local crews, uh, a lot of opportunities there. I'm actually looking forward to uh, putting this into action and reaping the benefit of this uh, <laughs> program. Yeah. The only outstanding things we have are the number two common. The assembly of the AW139 is complete. A battery refitted uh, service because we're we'll both flat. Okay, yep. It's passed a ground test, and now Ishmael and David prepare to take it up. These are the approvals that allow us to fly the aircraft. This is the final stage of the legal side of it that says that we're allowed to go and fly this aircraft and carry passengers to the offshore environment. After months of anticipation, Ishmael is looking forward to the benefits of the AW139's advanced avionics. This aircraft flies by itself better than the pilots. Not many pilots would like to agree to that, but um, it is uh, how the modern avionics works. It's more of uh, managing and monitoring what's going on in front of you. It does take you back to the first time you flew an aircraft where you, you do have a big grin on your face because it fundamentally is a fun job. There's no two ways about it. On a nice sunny day like today, going out and flying the aircraft is just a sheer joy. The new kit will enable Anduki to be an efficient service hub for Brunei's expanding offshore industry well into the next decade. <laughs>